Providing insights to help you grow your business, improve yourself, and add value to those around you. You're listening to the Success is a Choice podcast, where you get a peek into the lives of industry leaders as they share their stories with you. Hey, welcome everybody to the Success is a Choice Podcasting Network. I appreciate you watching this live on YouTube, Rumble, Facebook, wherever you're watching this, or you're maybe listening to it on the Success is a Choice Podcast Network. Before we get to our great guest today, I want to remind you that today's episode is brought to you by FreeLeadershipWorkshop.com. FreeLeadershipWorkshop.com. Get some culture, some teamwork, some leadership, free webinars, free sessions every single week for the whole school year. Check that out. Freeleadershipworkshop.com. Today's guest, very excited to have Chef Andrew Gruel on the show. He has a long list of things that he's done in his career. You've probably seen him on various different TV shows on the Food Network. Um, he is just all over the place. He's an expert at all kinds of good, yummy food. Chef Andrew Gruel, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. I uh, I feel as if I've entered the pantheon of leaders after seeing the intro of such amazing faces and names. So thank you for having me. It's an honor. Well, one of the uh, one of the things I talk about with leadership is that you make others better or you make situations better. And we'll actually get into that here in a few minutes about what you've done, you know, kind of taking on the government in your state and and helping make things better for other restaurant owners as well. So we'll get into the, that leadership, you know, uh, the Pantheon, as you say, we'll, we'll add you to that list because, because you were definitely courageous, but first I want to get to, you know, some other stuff, you know, food. I want to talk about food. Now I will watch these shows with my wife and I'm just, I'm, I always think that these judges on these TV shows or whatever, they're, they're way too smart. They're way too complicated. And I'm a guy that grew up with like pork and beans, hot dogs, SpaghettiOs. What is, is, is there anything that you can't make when it comes to being a chef? Well, I think there's a lot of dishes that I can't make just based on time, right? So many of classic French dishes require hours and hours of fundamental <laughs> techniques uh, from the building of stocks and sauces into things like, you know, terrines and long braises and complicated competition like dishes that you traditionally see in a more uh, archaic hotel or American Culinary Federation like setting. Culinary competitions used to actually really be a serious thing. Uh, the Bercuse d'Or. Nowadays, we don't see it as much, but the title of certified master chef uh, has been thrown around too much lately. There is a real level, a hierarchy where you become a certified master chef. And to get to that pinnacle, it requires a knowledge of dishes that I think most chefs or executive chefs don't understand and appreciate. So yes, there's a lot of things I can't make from that perspective. But in the general, you know, litany of everyday dishes, I think understanding the basics and the fundamentals of cooking give you the give anyone the opportunity to improvise just like you would with like a jazz standard. I use music as the example. Are you, uh, are you somebody that if, if you've never made something before, you'll, you'll just kind of improvise or are you somebody that's, that's going to go through the, you know, grandma's old cookbook or, or check out online all the directions to making something. I love reading old cookbooks, old recipes to understand what traditional techniques are that built the dish that we know today. It doesn't necessarily mean that I follow the techniques the same way because I think science has improved in the, from a culinary perspective where we've learned that some of the age old techniques don't necessarily work as good as we thought. Um, you know, like, for example, we used to think that searing meat actually locked the juices into meat. And it's 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 the polar opposite, which is now why I push this reverse sear technique. 
but still you want to understand where these recipes came from. And then you want to match the value of those recipes at the end with the right flavors. Well, I mentioned in the intro that you've been on a bunch of cooking shows. You, you own a bunch of restaurants. You founded a bunch of restaurants. Give us kind of a 30,000 foot view, if you would, of, of kind of your career and, and drop some names of your restaurants and, and different things that you've done. Yeah, great. I started off just like most high school kids who needed to get a job working in the restaurant industry. For me, it was like 14 or 15. And, you know, I went to a local catering company, started working there, and then eventually worked into a, a real fine dining restaurant in a hotel. But once again, I was just peeling potatoes and washing dishes. I went to college to study piano performance philosophy. I was a runner, a competitive runner, and that was my life. I got really involved in college working in restaurants because once again, I needed spending money. And I ended up spending more time in the restaurant than I was in classes. And I came to that point where I realized, you know what, I'm not going to waste money in college when it, this might be what I want to fulfill in terms of a career in life. I love the aspect of the kitchen. And then I hit the road traveling around, working in as many restaurants and kitchens as I could, went back to school, got my culinary arts degree, went back to school again and got my food service management, food marketing degree, business degree, and then ultimately um, opened up my own restaurant. But what's interesting about that is, is that I had taken some time off after the economy crashed in 2009 to start a nonprofit with the Aquarium of the, of the Pacific in Southern California. The focus was on sustainable seafood. It was a passion project of mine, educating chefs on how to choose the right types of seafood, marine conservation, and where we connect with the ocean. And in doing that, I realized there was an, a void in the market to serve high quality seafood, but at that cost and convenience of fast food. I couldn't raise any money for the restaurant, so I bootstrapped it, started with one food truck, went from one to four food trucks over six months, opened my first brick and mortar with like no money in April of 2012. And then I grew that to uh, 33 locations. And I ultimately sold the restaurant concept last year as a multi-unit international franchise group. Um, and I've started over. Now I'm doing the same thing again, but with a new concept. I also have a pizza concept. So my new concept is called Calico Fish House. I have a pizza concept called Big Parm, a parent company called American Gravy LLC, which is all of our concepts under one roof. And we're just growing that. Well, you mentioned Big Farm, uh, Big Parm, Big Parm, yeah. excuse me, not uh, Freudian slip there, but Big Parm. Uh, I, I love uh, that you hate pineapple on pizza. I do. I think it's the wrong move. I think it makes the pizza soggy and wet. If you want to add pineapple for the flavor, do it at the end as a salsa, maybe with some Serrano chilies for spice, but don't don't bake it on your pizza. It's just not the right thing to do. Now, I was watching uh, Joe Rogan and he had Elon Musk on in uh, one of the episodes a couple months ago and they uh, are on Halloween night, actually. And Joe Rogan talked about his favorite pizza in the world is anchovies and pineapple. Yeah, and they actually ordered it and brought it in studio and ate it during the podcast. I'm all for the anchovies, but the pineapple element, I just don't understand. I figured as a seafood guy, as a, as a fish guy, you would love, you would love the anchovies, but the pineapple, not so much. Yeah. Yeah. We do a lobster pie and it works. It's kind of like a garlic butter finish, that rich buttery lobster on the pie, light on the cheese. People love that one. So that's an alternative to the anchovies, which are oily and somewhat non-memorable for uh, people who eat anchovies out of the can, but that's as far as I'll go. So when you're invited or you go to a picnic or a cookout or the family reunion or whatever, is there a, a go-to dish that you bring? Um, you know, I'm a simple guy, so it's always dips. It's always some sort of dip or, uh, you know, you know, big center pot uh, bake, but unique flavors, fresh ingredients. I'm also the lobster guy uh, by proxy. So, you know, lobster rolls or some sort of lobster casserole. That seems to be the uh, the element. But I'll tell you here because we've got, a, you know, this is a longer form podcast is that when I was uh, in Maine, which is where I went to college, I was lobstering and I hated lobstering. I mean, just ripping your hands open. <laughs> and then my job at the restaurant was to break down the lobsters for the lobster roll. So hundreds of lobsters, right? When I went back to culinary school and I ended up back on the East Coast, I worked for the Ritz-Carlton there in Boston. What was my first job? Breaking down lobsters. That's the job they gave me. And I remember doing that. And I said, after this job, I will never work with lobsters again. And now I opened up a restaurant whose number one seller was the lobster roll, the lobster boil, the lobster grilled cheese, the lobster burger. So 
it's a lesson in life that uh, you know your your biggest enemy ultimately becomes your biggest success. So was there a a thing that you really were excited about to do with lobster? You were man, this is this is going to work. I, I want to do this, and then it ended up turning out not so good, and and you scrapped it, and and it never really took off. Yeah, I did a lobster ramen burrito back in 2014, and it went viral across like the buzz feeds of the world. And I never liked it. I did it because I thought it was kind of funny. And uh, it, it, it like took off, right? So when it first launched on BuzzFeed, this was before we had all of these online platforms. It was kind of the central one. We had like hundreds of people show up and we're, we're boiling packets of like Marchu ramen, making these lobster ramen burritos. And every single one I put out, I despised it. People loved it, absolutely loved it. And I refused to ever put it on the menu after that. So it was kind of like a one and done situation. Now, is there a dish or or something that you just you just never quite get it right? You yeah. never uh, it, whatever it is, the perfect Mexican rice. My wife can do it, and she can do it with her eyes closed. She's Mexican descent. She <laughs> grew up in Southern California. I mess it up every single time. I don't know what it is. She gets it perfect, and the kids refuse to eat my rice. They can. T- do, do you have a blind taste test? Or that would just be not unfair. No, no, no. We'll do blind taste as they know. They they know when they they smell it when they walk in the door. I mean, she's got. I'm convinced that she's putting MSG in there. Like I searched her sock drawer expecting to find MSG, you know, in a hidden spot, but nothing yet. I'll figure it out. <laughs> so, so are there are there specialties that she has other than the Mexican rice that you don't, or do you guys pretty much cook the same kind of things? We're polar opposites when it comes to cooking. So that's what's funny and it works out well. She went to culinary school. She concentrated in baking and pastry arts. So she's obviously got the, you know, the the more calculated cooking style, following recipes, baking pastry, breads. She's phenomenal at making breads. Uh, and she's a lot lighter, right? She can pull together lighter in the sense of like salads and marinated vegetable dishes. I'm a bit more on the heavier side, dinners, <laughs> mayonnaise, butter sauces. It's that French technique in me, although I'm Italian, but still. Um, we come together, however, where those Italian flavors mix with traditional Mexican flavors, because I always say Italian and Mexican cuisine, the only difference is basil and cilantro. Everything else is the same. So we, we, we find that to be our, you know, on a Venn diagram, those are our concentric circles. So you, uh, you ran cross country in Maine. Did you ever have to run at any of the uh, ski lodges up there and, and take on some of the mountains? Oh yeah. That was always, so every summer leading into that, I would go to like a running camp, a Nike running camp from freshman year in high school on. And we would hit the slope. We would hit like, you know, Killington or Sunday river or any of these ski areas. And we would do all of our intervals up the ski slopes. I miss that actually. It was a heck of a workout. Uh, very, very much not zone two training. <laughs> yeah. Maine, the way life should be. Yeah, I know. I, uh, I actually went on our honeymoon to Maine. Um, I'm probably the only person in the world that, that has actually gone to Maine for the honeymoon, not Hawaii, not, not someplace like that. We went to Maine. Yeah. It's funny. My wife and I, our honeymoon, we went to New York and I did the today show, uh, 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 cooking a lobster burger. That was our honeymoon. So I still owe her one. Hey, that was, that was a great episode that, that looked awfully tasty. Well, most of the stuff that you make is looks pretty tasty. Thank you. You always tell everybody with food TV, it's like we get pushed to the end of every single show. So whether I'm on Fox or whatever I'm doing, they'll be like, yeah, you've got four minutes to do this shoot. And when everybody goes over 10 seconds, when it comes to my shoot, they'll go in my ear and be like, you've got two minutes. So we rehearsed this. The Today Show makes us rehearse all of these, all the cooking segments. So we rehearsed it down to the four minute mark. Two seconds before we go on, they go, it's three minutes. Make it happen in three minutes. So it was like, you know, fast, fast, uh, fast forward cooking for that episode. I still recall. Absolutely. That, that, uh, you know, when, when people go on that, you know, obviously you've got the food cooked ahead of time or, or you, you've got some food cooking and then yeah. you make it and make other stuff in front of people. Uh, yeah. tell us something that maybe we wouldn't know. i maybe people didn't even know that, but I guess if you watch it, you would obviously realize you can't cook a hamburger in two minutes. Yeah, well, I'll tell you what, the, that the judging, um, I'll, maybe I'll get sued for saying this, I won't I won't say, tell networks, but a lot of the TV shows, the judging, some of it's predetermined, and also you shoot the judging and cooking segments, like sometimes months after the like live stuff. So, and you also, 
they don't cook it for you. A lot of times it's production crew that's cooking the food for you to taste on camera. So you're eating this cold food that's been sitting there for like five hours and you have to kind of fake your reaction to it because some of that's been scripted. And I don't want to say that it's fake in the sense that it's not, <laughs> that it that it's kind of like predetermined, but it's, you know, it's TV, right? Like you've got to script it for production purposes. So it's not always what it seems. Well, speaking of reality TV and fake, you uh, start in an episode with Meghan Markle. Yes. That one was real. So the chopped, chopped is real. Like that's all real timing. The kids are actually doing it. Um, they're making those dishes and the judges have the say in kind of who gets cut and who gets chopped and who doesn't. Well, that was before she became queen or princess or whatever it is yes. that she became. Yeah. Was yeah. Uh, uh, that was just one episode, correct? Correct. I want to say it was like a week later was when she announced that she was dating Prince William. <laughs> okay. Okay. Very interesting. So did you make anybody cry? Was, was, uh, we, it doesn't have to be Meghan Markle, but did you make anybody, was that your goal to ever make anyone cry? Cause we know that makes good reality TV. Yeah. It's funny you say that because that it really is reality TV. I can't tell you how many times I've had producers in my ear, like we need tears, go harder, go harder. <laughs> it's like every single time. And it's just so, it's so trite, but, uh, yeah, we've made a lot of people cry. Uh, it's unfortunate. Uh, when they get cameras in their faces, people's nerves really percolate to the surface. So a lot of times the tears are nothing more than just wet, wet nerves, uh, as opposed to raw emotion. But, you know, tears are the way to go. It's like they have their playbook, right? And they know they need the tears. That's the way it goes. And going back to the Meghan Markle episode, I got to say this. She's the nicest person in the world. She was phenomenal in that episode, the most down to earth person. So what's okay. become of the Meghan Markle, you know, um, conversation is interesting to me because I, I obviously never saw any of that. Well, I of course did like everybody else. And I just prejudged her. I just, yeah, yeah. I, you, you, know. you know, when you're on the outside, that's what you got to do. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Especially after watching the South park episode. I don't know if you ever watched that, but, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Very funny South park episode about her. Yeah. But, uh, uh, so you, you went to college, you not only ran in college, but you played the piano, you were piano performance was that how you ended up getting your wife to marry you you played some great romantic song or was it your cooking it was it was it was probably more the cooking i don't even think she knew i played the piano i mean so we we met we went on uh like three dates uh and we got married after six weeks so i proposed to her at like four weeks <laughs> and then we got married at six weeks um and now okay. we've got now we've got more than 10 years and uh four kids so sometimes when you know you know well, well done. Did you have a go to? Did you have a go to piano song for the for the ladies? Uh, you know, not really. Just I, I'm I was an improv guy, so like anything in some sort of a minor scale that then has a a positive major scale cadence. They always love that. <laughs> uh, I played piano for a little bit. Definitely didn't go to college to do it, but uh, my my mom thought one day it would be a great thing if I played the offering at church. Okay. And so I played Nadia's theme okay. in church, which is the Young and the Restless yeah. soap opera theme song. So yep. I'm probably the only guy to ever play Young and Restless in church during the offering. Yeah, may maybe. But I, but you know what's funny is, is that growing up, like that was the sheet music. It was a lot of the theme music from the um, soap operas. I remember learning, learning a lot of those songs, learning like also Fame, Chariots of Fire, right? Like those right. are the classics. <laughs> Absolutely. So – Thinking about business, running running a restaurant, uh, you know, give us some things that we wouldn't know about running a restaurant because we just go in, we order our food, we complain if it's not good or or to our liking, and and we think that you know restaurant owners make millions of dollars, you know, in, yeah, in net well, profit. Yeah, restaurant owners don't typically don't make any money. Um, you know, for us, I think it's more of a love and a passion for the craft. The the, the the element of the restaurants that people don't see or understand is the human variable, right? We, every other industry has been mechanized to really, you know, such a minute degree. And this is, this is really still the human variable. So every single dish that comes out of a kitchen requires so much consistency, love and passion. I mean, anybody who's in a bad mood can ruin an entire restaurant in one day. So you're really building a team and you're, you're generating um, it in and of itself. I joke and say that, if I had to go back, 
I wouldn't get the food service management or the culinary arts degree. I'd get the psychology degree because so much of it is the human variable. And you're only as good as your worst player. And I know that's a that's a cliche, but it really, really is the case. So one of the things that I learned early on is, is that you need to actually pay your dishwashers the most money of anybody in the restaurant because they are the engine that keeps the restaurant going. In the absence of a dishwasher, a restaurant will fall apart in one night. And um, that, you know, that's a key. That's a key to it. So the guys you don't see, the gals you don't see, the people that aren't in the front, because the servers, they're the actors and actresses. You know, the production crew in a movie are the ones that put the movie together. They're the talent. So they come in and work four or five hours and make, you know, upwards of $100 an hour. And they do hard work. I'm not putting them down. But if you don't have the dishwasher, then they've got nothing to serve. They've got no clean plates to put their food on. So I often see the help wanted, you know, and I hear horror stories about nobody wants to work in restaurants. Is that true? And if it's if it's true, why is it so hard to get people to work in the restaurant business right now? Um, well, it's true for some restaurants. I don't think the restaurant industry as a whole has had a people per people first approach over the years. Um, I think that restaurants, because the margins are so tight, typically it's an owner operator. Stress is so high, um, it, you know, that there's been a, um, you know, a lack of uh, focus on building people up through the restaurant system, especially on the flip side, because so many people use the restaurant as a stepping stone to other careers. Like most people who come into work at a restaurant, it's not about building themselves up in order to become a restaurant manager, a general manager, a director of operations. It's about, I need a quick job in order to get to X, Y, and Z. I'm in college. I'm a struggling actor. I'm a struggling actress. I'm making money on the side. So that, that there's a dissonant, dissonance there from the people first approach to the people who are applying for those jobs. Uh, we take a bit of a different approach to it in that even if we have people who come in looking for a job as a stepping stone, we'll still be able to build a lot of their skills and treat them well, give them you know le a level of equity, not always literal equity, but profit sharing and incentive, pay them well. And you know it's a quid pro quo. What are some things that you've done creatively that maybe other restaurants aren't doing that that has won you some loyalty with customers or has helped your business be more profitable than maybe it would have been and and not even in the short term profitability but but maybe long term profitability with some sustainable profits well giving away food right so number 1 um i don't spend a lot of dollars on marketing traditional marketing instead we give away food to get people in the door because gotcha. and then i have control over that product there's not a percentage return if i send a direct mail order to 10,000 households and i get a five percent return that's considered a success i consider that a 95 percent loss but if i give away five thousand dollars worth of food then that's customers i brought in the door if i deliver properly on my food then i get a hundred percent return on that investment so no traditional marketing giving food away helping the community, right? Don't discount. Discounts are junk. Either give it away or don't, or or that's it. So um, like a five or 10% discount to me is a slap in the face. Give it to them for free or at least do half off. Maintain um, maintain a, a regular discount for people that, and, that you believe in in the community. All uniformed police officers, fire, EMTs eat for free in our restaurants. Veterans always eat 50% off. I said don't discount, but I think 50% is kind of the threshold. And maintain that, right? If that's something you believe in, it doesn't. That might not be something you believe in, but stick to something that draws the community in and maintain your consistency. So those are some of the things that we think from a sales perspective. Because making money in a restaurant is about driving sales. It's not about tightening margins. That comes next. Hmm. And and uh, I heard once that uh, well, not what you've 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 done this more than once, but the free food expanding that out into free kids meals things like that, which as parents, you know, you're a parent of four kids that that's awfully, we appreciate that. Yeah. Because what, as a parent, right. Even though it only cost me six or $7 for my kids food at the restaurant, it's a 50% chance they're going to eat it. Right. So, so <laughs> right. one of two things is going to happen. It gets thrown away or I eat it. So when you're, it, it, you know, that's a, regardless of the dollar amount, giving it away for free, suddenly removes that emotional barrier of like, oh, I'm wasting this or I just burned $7, $6, which in the grand scheme of things to some isn't a major amount of money when a regular meal costs $25 or $30. So it's that kind of psychological incentive. Well, you had a platform being on TV, quite a number of shows. You've also had a platform as a successful business 
uh, owner in the restaurant business. And those two things combined kind of helped you during the COVID lockdowns in terms of having another platform, being a leader, coming back to what we were talking about earlier about leadership. And, and you kind of took on the government of California. You said, listen, the way you're doing things here with COVID is, is not in the best interest of people. And it's, and it's inconsistent, hypocritical at worst, inconsistent at best. Talk a little bit about your experience with, with the lockdowns and how that affected small business owners. And I, I think the average person probably doesn't realize all that went in to the lockdowns with small business owners. Yeah. And I would even say, you know, just keeping it kind of vanilla, we didn't necessarily take on the government. We we filled in where they left off, which was in yeah. a lot of areas. Right. So for us, it was about there was never a framework or never any education th that distilled down to the small business owners as to how to operate and what they could do in order to properly maintain sanitary standards while also keeping themselves financially afloat. Mm -hmm. Every time the government said they were going to help, there was no money available for them to help because in, especially in California, they misappropriated the funds and all of those funds, especially for unemployment, they went to fraudsters and it was, oh, whoops, nothing we can do about it. So when they shut down businesses and employees were left just helpless, there was nobody to help them. And even the government, because this when they shut down businesses in California restaurants specific in December of 2020, the second time going into the holidays, going into Christmas, going into this tough season, all these employees got fired and the government was like, well, you can't get unemployment. You can, you'll be approved for unemployment, but the money's not there. You'll get it in February or March. And it was like, well, what are these people supposed to do? So that's when we stayed open outdoors. That's when we raised our fund and raised over a half a million dollars to give to people, not just in California, throughout the country in order to pay their bills, in order to pay rent, electricity, you name it. Uh, I'll tell you what's funny, though, about that is, is that we did that and we gave money to people of all different walks of life. I mean, we didn't filter it based on any predetermined political, social or cultural, um, you know, prerequisite. And a lot of the people, we were the champions of it. But now moving forward, as we've continued forward, saying, look, smaller government is better. I've become an enemy of a lot of those people who have since said, yeah, I took money from you, but you're a jerk. Like, how dare you say the government's not there to help? And I'm like, do you not remember two years ago when I had to step forward and help you because the government couldn't help you? There's an amnesia that exists that I think is somewhat disheartening. But um, we'll continue forward with positivity and keep doing this. So so when I when I think of the lockdowns and when I think of like restaurants being shut down, take us a little bit behind the, the curtain of how that affects a restaurant or or even, you know, being shut down for two weeks or or anything like that or or some of the uncertainty that goes okay. into it. Yeah, perfect. So let's say you're a restaurant and you've got all of your vendors are on two week terms. All right. So, you know, you're paying kind of one bill at a time. But when you have no sales, those previous bills pile up and now the two weeks has gone by. So what you owed now is two weeks previous before the shutdown worth of money, electricity, the landlords are charging you rent. So you have all of these expenses that hit these fixed costs plus payroll. You don't just fire your employees like you've got to at least be able to support your employees. And even if you do let your employees go, you need to give them severance, paid time, whatever they accrued in ter terms of paid time off. So if I shut down two weeks later, I could very well in any restaurant have a pile of $50,000 that's due today. None of those bills stopped. None of those payments, like no one said, the landlord didn't say don't pay us. The insurance companies didn't say don't pay us. The electricity, the state, the state bills. I'll tell you what, even sales tax, right? That you build up your sales tax and then you pay it a month later. They weren't saying don't pay us. So now the cash in your account is gone. Nobody's backfilling any of those financial coffers and you have to shut down. And then with what the government did was they're like, oh, well, we'll give it to you through PPP or the Employee Retention Credit Program. Well, that took six, eight, 12 weeks sometimes, and it was all over. Mm. So when, uh, you know, we look at, I go into a restaurant, for instance, I order a hamburger. I look at it as, well, you know, I know how much the meat costs. I know how much the bun costs, all this kind of stuff. Kind of going back to the, when we joked earlier, you know, restaurant owner making millions, you're, you're taking on millions, you know, every restaurant owner is, is flush with cash. Why am I wrong in that? Well, let's use it. Let's think about it this way. Every single dollar, right? 
So every dollar a restaurant brings in, 30 to 35% of it goes towards labor. 30 to 35% of it goes towards food cost, right? That's just food and labor. Those are only two expenses. That's called your prime cost. So let's say on the low end, it was 30 and 30. Now that's 60%. So 60 cents is gone right there. Then you got to pay rent. You got to pay insurance. You got to pay all the government taxes, which is now going up to around 10% of absolutely everything, right? And I'm not talking taxes on income. I'm talking about all the, the, the taxes along the way that you got to pay. So let's say that you're, you're, Occupancy cost is 10 to 15%, 10% on the low end, 10% for insurance and other costs, paper, plastic, et cetera. So now you're up to like 90 cents on the dollar that's going out for everything. So even if I get up to 95 cents on every dollar, I've got five cents left on every single dollar <laughs> if I'm a good operator, if I'm a good restaurateur. But that's before any interest that you have to pay on the loans you took out in order to open the restaurant. Um, so you're done, right? Like there's no money there. It, it's over. Which is which? Which is great to hear sometimes because you know we think simplistic uh, terms, but uh, yeah, when you own your when you own your own small business, you you uh, understand that or you learn that really really quick. Um, yeah. Is uh, when I think when I go to a restaurant, one of the uh, controversial things is tipping. Mm-hmm. Want to get your take as someone who owns a number of restaurants, been in the restaurant business for a while. What is kind of your take on on tipping? Is it is it kind of too high, too low, just right? Is it the business owner's responsibility? Is it is it the customer's responsibility? Just your overall take as someone who's in the industry. I think generally the tipping culture has gotten somewhat out of hand. I think that you should tip based on the service. Don't tip based on what you feel is like a social obligation. I do believe that a lot of businesses are not that they're paying the base mandatory wage or salary because they are going to subsidize a lot of those wages through the tips. Um, I firmly believe that you should pay a little bit higher and um, distribute the tips across your entire business, which now you're legally allowed to do tip pooling so long as it's involved in the service pool. I also think that generally the state governments need to look at aggregating what you make in tips and your base wage towards what they consider to be minimum wage, right? So you have st- certain states where there's a tipped wage, um, which I don't 100% agree with. And you have other states where like, we'll pay people 18 to $20 an hour, but then if they make an additional, they'll, they'll easily make an additional 50 to $70 an hour on tips. So you're making $100 an hour and my kitchen guys are making 25 to $30 an hour, which is high for a kitchen person, but then we'll redistribute that across some of the staff. But I would like to see, a system where payroll taxes come down, okay, but wages go up. So it's a net, let's say it's net zero. There's no change for the business owner, but wages go up, payroll taxes go down, and we we slowly start to eliminate this mandatory tipping culture so that my servers make 30 bucks an hour, but my payroll taxes on that $30 an hour go down a little bit. And then my customers can tip five to 10% so that they don't feel like they're out of pocket as much and then the servers can still aggregate 35 to $50 an hour, which is a pretty good base wage overall. It's living wage by the MIT living wage calculator. Well, we'll get you out on this last question as a, as a food guy, as a, as someone that can make anything, you can make anything, but, uh, and you appreciate lots of things. What would be your ideal last meal? I know that's kind of a cliche type question, but, uh, in, in my will, Last will and testament. I literally have that. I want spaghettios and chicken nuggets. Chicken chicken nuggets served at my funeral. Yeah, I mean it would probably be like a double bacon cheeseburger and a ton <laughs> of and like a like a coffee ice cream sundae. Uh, yeah. just, you know, caloric overload, a lot of grease, a lot of fat uh, in a burger form, and you know that would be it. Well, what do you have uh, next? What's on the horizon? Is you got any projects going on that, that you want to share with us? Yeah, we do. We've got a couple um, fun I, uh, TV shows in the works right now, some involving the family, um, some more around the business of restaurants. Uh, so we'll be announcing those, you know, in the next like three to four months. I've got my Substack American Gravy, which has been a great way to be able to give people an access to an encyclopedia of cooking techniques that they can use at home. And then we are scaling uh, Calico Fish House outside of California. So we're going to finalize our franchise registration on that concept and ideally start selling um, 
you know, franchise deals for to blow Calico Fish House up across the country. Really good seafood chop house, utilizing local ingredients and keeping it simple, keeping it easy, giving people jobs. Well, awesome. He is at Andrew Gruel on Instagram, and he is at Chef Gruel on Twitter, also known as X. So go ahead and follow him. Check him out. We will put all those links in the show notes, some videos, some different things about him. But definitely go check him out. We appreciate him joining us. Thank you, Andrew, for joining us. We thank all of you for watching this, for listening to this. Feel free to share this with somebody who likes cooking or just likes to eat. They might find this episode interesting. So share that. Go ahead and smash the like button or smash the notifications button, whatever you're supposed to do, whatever I'm supposed to say. Just don't smash your phone too hard. Hey, until next time, remember, success is a choice. What choice will you make today?